it is the future of learning, period. Not because we think it is, but because this is the natural evolution of computer-based training or e-learning. It's what the incoming demographic is going to require in order to learn. All players, low down, all right, we're live. Welcome to another episode of The Merge, where we make sense of defense in an enjoyable way. If you found us on Spotify or YouTube, don't forget to check out the newsletter. The link's in the show notes. That's a laser-guided knowledge bomb. It hits your inbox every uh, Sunday and Tuesday. Motherhood's complete. We're going to jump right into today's episode. I'm pretty excited about this. We've got a trifecta today. So we've got a new topic, a new company, and some new tech. So today's guest, without further ado, is Scott Schneider, the CEO and the head of growth of HDX Labs. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Mike. Happy to be here, and thanks for having us today. So before we dig in, I, I tease that we have it's a new company, a new topic, and some new tech. But if you could give us the tweet-level summary about HTX Labs and what you're doing and why you're doing it, and then we'll kind of dig into the details. Sure. So HTX Labs, we are really on a mission to accelerate and elevate the future of learning through immersive technology. So we started the company in 2017. We've been at it for better part of seven years, and, and that's the mission that we're on. 2017, um, when you say seven years, that sounds like a long time ago. 2017 doesn't sound long, that long ago. So when I say your new company, sorry, I didn't mean to insult you about that. Seven years is a good run. <laughs> no, this, this, uh, any, anytime you're in the emerging tech space, it seems like a lifetime, but it, it goes awfully fast. Things change uh, every other day. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> so uh, everyone loves a good uh, origin story. So let's dig in uh, in 2017. So founded HTX Labs in 2017. Where, where did you come up with the idea of, of why you wanted to you know, build a team and start a company doing this? Yeah, so we were approached by another company who was looking at kind of 3D technology, spatial technology and VR. And our background is all, all around enterprise software. So we saw an opportunity to take this kind of consumer focused virtual reality technology and enterprise capability and kind of mash them up and move this kind of technology into the enterprise, into the Department of Defense. And we really didn't start off with a training focus, but that's kind of where we've uh, gravitated towards. It's a perfect application for hands-on, kind of learn by doing, which is really what the, the company and the technology is, is based on. Well, the enterprise software, that definitely is gonna give you a big upper hand. Um, kind of offset by trying to sell to one of the world's hardest customers to sell stuff to the, the Department that of was, Defense. That was not our plan. We had no interest whatsoever in going after the Department of Defense. We were a, a bootstrap startup and you don't take a, a, a small company and go up against the, the, the federal government in terms of contracting. But here we are and it's been a it's been a wild ride, but it's been a great journey. Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to get into that in, ju in just a minute. Uh, some really, really cool tech we're going to talk about. Um, but before we get too far, you founded another company. Uh, you had some history as a founder before, an entrepreneur. Is that right? Yeah, this is our third startup. I joined my first startup in 2000, kind of when everybody else was doing it too. We didn't start that one, but I joined that and kind of got the bug. In 2003, we started our first startup company and, and I spent 25 years in oil and gas. So uh, again, enterprise software, oil and gas, did that for so from 2003. We sold that in 2012 and did a three-year contract there and then got right back into it. And kind of here we are in 2023. So we've been in the startup business about 20, 22, 23 years. Nice. Okay. HTX Labs. I had, I had a few episodes ago. Listeners might know this. We had a, a space company on and uh, I just randomly asked a question like, what does it stand for? And it went down this whole rabbit hole, which is a fascinating <laughs> story about Lord of the Rings. Um, so it got me on this kick. So every time I have a company now, I try to find out like, where did the name come from? So I'm going to guess and you just tell me if I'm right or wrong. Okay. HTX Labs was founded in Houston, Texas. Is that is it Houston, Texas, HTX? Is that it? That is uh, that is one possible source of the name of the company. And yeah, that's the obvious one. But early on, it was about the human training experience. So we could derive HTX from that as well. Um, when we started the company, we were trying to figure out how can we scale instructors? How can we capture expertise? And, and with our background in oil and gas, uh, a lot of people that work in oil and gas look like me, gray hair. And, and that institutional knowledge is going to walk out the door. How do you capture that before they leave the building? 
So the human training experience was was another way to back into HGX Labs. All right. So before we jump into your product, which is uh, which is really cool, can you explain uh, the difference between VR and and mixed reality and extended reality? There's a, there's a bunch of different realities. Of how do you describe them to you know someone like me who doesn't know anything about it? So there's virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality, mixed reality. You cover them all. They'll they'll ultimately kind of all merge into something that you might call extended reality. But virtual reality is really about taking the learner to another place and putting you in a in an environment that is based on reality, but you're going there as opposed to augmented reality where you're still in the physical world, but you're able to overlay and augment that reality with other information. We have historically focused primarily or largely on virtual reality. So we create these amazing environments that look just like reality, but can also provide you opportunities to do things you can't do in the real world, like take an aircraft and turn it transparent and see the inside of the aircraft and and see the systems. That's not something you can do in in the real world. Yeah, there's a really, really interesting video you have on on your website that that starts digging into like the the different layers of a C-130 and you can see the, right. the the hydraulic lines, the fuel lines and how it's all actually put together versus, you know, the old way uh, when I grew up, which is, you know, here's a diagram in a book, but it, it's just a nice diagram because it's easy to write down and show you how things are connected, but it's not the actual lay down of where all those systems are in the aircraft as they're, you know, they go through all the nooks and crannies and the twists and turns to go where they got to go and connect. So, yeah. It's not the best way to learn out of a you know a book or a PDF. It's it's the historical way to learn. But the next generation that's coming into the workforce and into the into the military is going to demand that the learning experience be elevated, more interactive. They grew up with phones in their face, and they're not going to take a PDF. So we have to adapt to that workforce changes. Yeah, that's right. So the product you have is called Impact, and that's the immersive training environment. So if you unpack impact <laughs> you tell us a little bit about what it is sure we can try to do that you know experiential technology so it's easier to understand if you've experienced it but impact is our platform and be an enterprise software uh, team we everybody needs a platform so we've built this platform that that takes a different approach to building these amazing immersive environments and and training lessons our approach is really about delivering the tools to the experts and to kind of teach them to fish. So we've developed this platform that allows with the right skill set to create a C-130 on a flight line, for example, in a virtual environment. And then we have some tools that allow subject matter experts without writing any code to go into those environments and create the lessons themselves. And we think this is the only way really to scale this technology. There's no way that a company our size or 10 companies our size could build all of the immersive uh, you know, the digital classrooms, for lack of a better term, and the lessons to satisfy the appetite of the Air Force, let alone the entire training market. So we've taken a very different approach. We're not trying to build all of the lessons and build all of the environments. We're trying to take a an open ecosystem kind of approach to this, very a partnering approach to to give the put the tools in the in the right hands to build these capabilities. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I went through uh, a lot of military training over the years. And some training curriculum is better than others. Sometimes you'll see that a contractor basically got a word, a contract to teach these courses and they build their own curriculum. And then when the contract ends, they just take all the, all the stuff that they developed and you got to start over. So it makes a lot of sense to have it kind of open-ended and, and make it kind of user facing. Well, they're, they're operating on the platform, but they own the material basically. Right. Yep. That's uh, exactly our approach. And, and there are other vendors out there that have a very different approach. As a company, we have no need to have a, a C-130 training curriculum, but the Air Force does. So as they build these environments and build these lessons, they own that content and they can change it. So they're in complete control of their future. They're not, they're not locked to us as a vendor. They can build these lessons and deploy them. It's all cloud-based, so they can deploy them to any student anywhere on the planet on almost any learning device. So it's a, it's a different approach. We're, we're trying not to lock anybody into us trying to make this as, as open and, and accessible as possible. So, so what includes the impact? So it's, it's obviously an immersive environment. So there's some kind of a, a VR headset and um, some hand controllers and uh, I would imagine, right? Yeah. I mean, we're not, 
we're not in the hardware space, so we try to stay very focused in our lane. We're a software company, but we, we the platform provides our customers with the ability to use pretty much any any headset from a high-end Vario headset down to a standalone headset. And when we started the company, we were very much a purist VR company, but it's hard to achieve scale if everybody has to have a headset because not everybody has a headset right now. So we, at some point, you kind of have to trade immersiveness for scale. And mm-hmm. so we've, we've, our platform also supports the same exact learning experience on a high-end headset down to a laptop and mouse and keyboard down to a tablet. So if all you've got is an iPad, you can, you know, your input device is your finger, not the controllers, but you still have the same exact learning experience. And that's how you achieve scale. A lot of folks have tablets, but not everybody has a VR headset. So again, that's what the, you know, the platform offers that capability right out of the box. Oh, that's good. I remember back probably, ooh, I date myself, uh, five, six, seven years ago, the Air Force, uh, right when Pilot Training Next was kind of kicking off, uh, a lot of pockets of uh, experimentation at different fighter bases, and everyone started buying VR goggles, and they're trying to figure out how to, how how can we use them, and how do we learn with them? And every base had a different, you know, vendor of goggles they bought, and they all had different, you know, attributes, and you couldn't take them into the classified spaces, and the software wasn't compatible, so base A couldn't really send their files to base B, and it was it was, the it was wild, definitely wild a learning curve. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it wasn't pretty, but you know, sometimes, uh, you know, the sausage making has to happen to, to kind of get, figure out what you want, what you, uh, what you don't want really. Yeah. Innovation is often very messy, especially when you're just starting out. And that's actually, you mentioned pilot training next. That's the, that's how we got started in the U S air force is we were focused on the private sector and, and the, the corporate enterprise. And, uh, we bumped into a, a lieutenant colonel with the Air Force out of Austin, Texas, and he was looking for this kind of technology. We were not focused at all, like I said, on the on the Department of Defense or the, the U.S. government, and he pulled us into pilot training next, and that's how we got started with the Air Force, and here we are probably five or six years later, fully uh, focused uh, on the U.S. Air Force. So you just ran into him in Austin, and he's like, hey, that, you have some cool tech. Solve my problem? <laughs> Yeah, actually, he, he was from Austin, but he came into Houston looking for this tech, and somebody said, hey, you need to go over and talk to HDX Labs. He walked into our office, and, and we had, like I said, there was, there was no aircraft, and we had no, we had no Air Force staff. Everything was heavy industry, or uh, actually, when we started the company, we started off doing active shooter training, so of all things, um, and you know, crisis kind of stuff. And, but he saw the platform, and he saw the potential, and he said, you need to, we need to pull you into pilot training next, and uh, within a couple of weeks, we were working on pilot training next, developing a bunch of emergency procedures for the T-6, which is how every Air Force pilot starts. So, That is a crazy story of how you got into the <laughs> defense space. So you, yeah, just some guy said, come, you know, come work with me. And usually yeah. it's the other way around. The, gov- the businesses are trying to beat down the doors of all the government offices. They go, listen to me, take my meeting. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, we were, uh, we were working out of an accelerator in Houston, and somebody said, go talk to those guys. And and uh, that's how it all got started. So we're, 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 we're fortunate. What was the lieutenant colonel's name? I think I might know who he is. Eric Fram. Colonel Fram. Nope. Sorry. I oh, don't. Okay. Yeah. I'll edit that out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> uh, that, yeah. That, that is a, that's an amazing story. So when you first, you know, got onto the base and you got your, your base access pass and you go for your first day, I would imagine you probably were like stepping back in time of the processes and the, the tools that are available for, for training humans, right? <laughs> it, was, it was a bit chaotic. You know, once again, as we mentioned earlier, innovation is a little bit messy. So, you know, we walked in and there was a bunch of, there's a bunch of hardware, some sleds, some computers, and it was kind of organized chaos. But that's how this all starts and, and you, you refine it over time. But uh, it was a great experience. It was at the same time incredibly frustrating because you want to want to move faster um, and you got to kind of move at the pace of whatever's necessary. Um, so it was frustrating, but it was an incredible learning experience. And, and out of that experience came what we have today in our impact platform. It became incredibly obvious that we couldn't build our engineering team couldn't build like an emergency procedure trainer for the T6 fast enough, let alone multiply that times all the aircraft platforms that, that are out there. We, we kind of went back to the, the, the drawing board and built the platform that we have today, which is very much a tools-based approach, putting the tools in the hands of those subject matter experts, the instructor pilots, seven-level maintainers who actually know how to do 
the thing that we're trying to train. So it was critical to where we are today. That's amazing. So most people or most companies, a startup, they, you know, the, the Holy grail is finding the product market fit. So you, you have an idea for product, you build a product, you go out, you try to find the customer and you do some customer surveys and some stuff to figure out what the customer might want. You, you guys had a little bit of the opposite where the customer is like, this is what I want. Can you build it? You're like, yeah, yeah, we can go back and, you know, we can rewicker our product to, to fit the, the market. So that's a, that's a pretty strong feedback signal when you're probably two, two and a half years old at that point, your company. Uh, yeah, we were probably in, in year two, probably middle of, middle of 2018 is when we met, um, we bumped into the Lieutenant Colonel and got into the air force. So we were probably 18 months into this and it was frankly pretty frustrating in the enterprise world because it was, it was early for VR and most companies in the private sector were doing this for, in our opinion, all the wrong reasons to look innovative, look cool, to attract talent. And that's not how you build a sustainable learning program, but the Air Force, they, they committed to this this next generation of training with Pilot Training Next, and that was a clear signal that this is something that's going to be a reality, and we got lucky enough and fortunate enough to, like I said, get pulled into that. Being early looks a lot like being wrong, and, <laughs> you know, it, it, time usually, uh, you know, shows you who was right, but you don't know uh, during, you don't really know. And that's that innovation space that you're talking about. There's a lot of trial and error and just flail and just trying to figure it out. And then finally something sticks and then you're kind of off to the races, but you do have to make a little bit of a bet there. Cause you're like, I don't really think it's, I don't know if it's going to work, but I believe in it. And you, you have enough data points and, and trust. So, um, yeah. pilot training next, uh, just real quick side note for some of the, uh, the listeners or viewers that aren't tracking, the problem that the Air Force had, uh, arguably still has, is that it can't it can't make enough pilots. So traditionally, uh, historically, they have a benchmark where the Air Force tries to produce or qualify 1,500 pilots a year. Um, historically, they never hit that goal. I think it's been like 20 years since they've hit it, <laughs> maybe. Um, but the problem is, is that the the way that they were training the pilots, it hadn't changed since the 1940s. Like the process is the, the time plus or minus a couple of weeks. It's about a 55 week training program uh, to get your wings and get qualified to fly an airplane. Then you have to go to another school to figure out which airplane you're going to fly uh, operationally. And so pilot training next was like, hey, can we cut that in half? We have all these technologies. We learn differently than we used to. Can we leverage that to solve this problem? And that's where it makes us a big difference of, of you're applying technology to solve a problem versus you're putting on a VR headset for the sake of saying you have a VR headset. <laughs> you nailed it. You know, we, you gotta, you have to identify the problem and, and not create a solution looking for a problem. This, this was a clear and present need within the air force to produce more pilots more quickly. And, and to your point, people don't learn the way they used to, and not everybody learns the same way. You need to have different kind of learning modalities and major general Edmondson, second air force commander recently said, we need different learning pathways. And this is what kind of maintenance training, tech training transformation learn from pilot training next is it can't be thought of as a pipeline of students. It has to have multiple pathways. People learn at different speeds and, and using different technologies. And, and so this is really about providing additional pathways that, that, isn't, that allows we, us to produce more aircraft maintainers and pilots than, than in the past. Yeah, that's exactly right. The, I, I remember that. I, I heard that interview uh, last last week, something like that. Mm -hmm. yep. And we need to get rid of the term pipeline. We have criteria. We have you know metrics and performance. And one of the reasons why it was you know called a pipeline is you couldn't put any person faster. You hit the right. benchmarks and you would sit and you'd all kind of progress as a class. And so everyone was forced to learn at the same pace, whether it was too fast or too slow. If you were uh, too slow, you would you know you get dropped. And if you were too fast, well, you just have a lot of free time. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, you kind of go at the pace of the slowest person, which is which is un, which is unfortunate. That's not you're not going to produce what you need. Yeah. Okay. So you got the pilot training next. Uh, spent a couple of years in there, kind of uh, uh, refining the product, and so now you're you you've kind of rewickered or re-engineered the product for for scale and accessibility. So so how do you? I think you talked a little bit about the different mediums, but uh, can you give me some examples of like like you said, aircraft maintenance is, you know, an example, but the different types of like applications of how you would use it. Sure. 
we're spending right now a lot of time in the maintenance aircraft maintenance space and and more broadly technical training so everything but pilots but we also continue to work on on pilot training but you know this technology generally speaking is really good we think for any any situation that is generally unsafe so whether you're on an offshore drilling rig or in a petrochemical facility or manufacturing your your first experience can't be going to the manufacturing line you're you're just going to that's an unsafe environment so you know critical hands-on training where you have to really learn to be proficient by doing the thing this is all based on the learning pyramid where 10 to 15% of what you hear and read you retain 90% of what you do you retain so this is very much a learning by doing approach and that's foundational to the company but you know, any any time it's your an unsafe situation or from a, a a job perspective or an employment perspective, it's better to learn in a virtual environment. As we say, mistakes are free in VR. Nobody gets hurt in VR. You can you can break a C-130 in VR and and nothing critical happens. But you go to a real C-130 and take it out of commission. That's not a good day. Yeah, <laughs> I think on your website there's a there's a short video of a immersive training for a, a, a crew chief. I think it was a C-130 crew chief and he's actually taxiing the virtual reality aircraft. You bet. So we, we think it's really amazing technology and I think we're just getting started. Yeah. One of the problems you talk about scalability and accessibility. One of the, one of the problems that I don't think a lot of people take the time to comprehend is, you know, we talk about, Oh, there's an 18 year old with a rifle. I'm like, well, there's also an 18 year old with a grease gun and an 18 year old with a wrench. And they're working on, you know, hundred million dollar aircraft in the training to go from high school graduate to basic training in a tech school. Those tech schools are, you know, six weeks, 12 weeks, maybe 20 weeks tops. And, and they're on the flight line learning and they have so much OJT, the learning curve out on the flight line from that, the textbook to the flight line is huge. And so having this uh, immersive training environment kind of bridges that divide. And when they hit the flight line, I would imagine that they're much more capable day one than they would be otherwise, right? Absolutely. What Pilot Training Next brought to our attention was what they call learning, moving learning to the left. So can we get into the high schools? Can we get exposure earlier, not just as a recruiting tool for the Air Force, but Again, to your point, can we get them more ready when they get to the flight line? And, and you know, we, we've done a lot of work up at Shepard Air Force Base, which, you know, center of the universe for kind of all technical training that happens within the Air Force. We basically reimagine their crew chief fundamentals course that they've been teaching the same way for, as your point, 40, 50, 60 years. And we were able to see almost a 50% decrease in the amount of time it takes to get through the training. Wow. And and once they hit the C-130, the physical C-130, they nailed it on the first time. You know, you can sit on your couch at home in a, a VR headset and just get reps and go through the same training 10 times, 50 times, whatever it takes. And when you get to the real C-130, you're going to be more prepared and more proficient. So that's the theory behind it. And I think it's, it is it is the reality that we're starting to see. That's that's awesome. And so Impact, is a you said it was a platform. And we talked a little bit about that. But that also means that you can get it certified once as a platform and then it has you can just deploy it to different locations for people who aren't aware for the government and plugging things in on government networks and stuff. There's a there's cybersecurity things and there's a there's a thing called an ATO, uh, an authority to operate. So it's government approval that you can interact with the government's networks with your uh, computer equipment, software, hardware. Uh, so that's generally treated as a pretty big barrier of entry for software companies trying to work with the Department of Defense. But you guys have bridged that divide, right? We have, and it was as painful as you made it sound. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's a complicated process. Cybersecurity is, is complicated in general, but uh, it's a complicated process. It's a fairly new and evolving process within the Department of Defense. And we spent probably two to three years working on our ATO from a cybersecurity perspective. And we achieved our ATO uh, last December, 2022. We were the first XR platform to achieve an ATO at the IL-4 level, impact level four, to run our software on AFNET or the Air Force networks, the, the Nipper net. There's plenty of software out there that runs on closed networks, but it will never run on an Air Force network until you get your ATO. So. It was a complicated process, but it's a necessary process. We have to be cyber secure across the board and the government has obviously takes that very seriously.
and so do we. <laughs> As a cloud-based platform, you have uh, scalability, and I would I would imagine that there's economies of scale from purchasing because you're able to deploy uh, on AFNet, right? You bet. And we don't really, I mean, we don't really deploy because it's it's in the cloud. Yeah. It's a multi-tenant, right? So we don't have to go install. It's it's all running in the cloud in our case on Microsoft Azure. So we inherit some of the cybersecurity controls of, of Azure for government. Um, but you still have, there's still additional uh, controls that you have to employ that uh, that are required by, by the Air Force. And that's what the ATO was all about. And that was a great segue. And my next question I was going to ask you, like, how do you actually get the thing? Uh, so it's in the cloud, somewhere in the cloud, right? So mm -hmm. you don't have to, you don't have to go anywhere, download anything, uh, or have someone install it on your computer. You can just go to, uh, you know, type a URL in, you have an access code or something. Um, but to get that, you have to do business with the government. And um, as you probably have learned this, uh, being traditionally uh, in the commercial side, working with the government is just really weird because the buyer <laughs> and the user aren't the same people or the same organization, right? Oh yeah. No, it's, it's a, I, I started out my career working for the U S government in DC a long time ago. And, uh, is that and where the gray hair came from? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Prematurely. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it is different because in the, in the commercial world, you need a requirement and a, and a solution and you can kind of figure out the rest in terms and they need budget. But in the, in the military, there's this thing called a contract vehicle that if you don't have that, you don't you don't get very far. So, and, and you're, you're right. The customer, the buyer, uh, is not always the same as the end user. Um, so it's a, it's been a, it's been a challenge because we feel like we have a solution and we know we, there are users out there that have a need, but it's not a matter of putting a contract together. We need a contract vehicle. Um, and timely for this discussion, we, we were just awarded a, a $90 million IDIQ last week. And that contract vehicle kind of gets us even further into the game. Cause now if you have a user who has a need and a customer with money, that money can go on that contract vehicle to purchase impact and, and our content delivery capabilities. So it is a strange uh, experience in working with the government, but frankly, we love our mission. We're playing a, a very small role in this national defense and preparedness mission. So we're, we're happy to be that, that play that, that small part. Well, first of all, congratulations on the on the contract. Uh, that's actually how I heard about HCX Labs. I saw the press release. I put it in the merge. I'm like, what is this? So then I reached out and, uh, you know, my people talked to your people and now here we are. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, oh, that's a really interesting company. There's probably a good story behind that. So the uh, it was a $90 million. You have a three-year contract. And right. for people who aren't aware and there's listeners out there to like, hey, this thing sounds great. I'm I'm in the Air Force. Like, what do I do? we'll put some uh, links in the show notes, but there's money and then there's the contract. And so it's weird. You usually you find the, the bigger problem is that you see organizations that have money and your money or something like that to spend, but they don't have a contract vehicle to spend that on anything. And so you'll see like fallout money, they call it. And a lot of air force bases, they'll buy like flat screen TVs and printers and office furniture because you can just, uh, there's a certain types of stuff you can buy. Um, but if you don't have a contract vehicle, you can't put money on it. And so, one of the the really good things about your type of contract, which is a IDIQ, and it's a sole source, so you're the only person on it, is right. that someone can just at end of your money. If you have money at the end of the year, you can actually put that money onto the the IDIQ and then pull the money out as uh, I think called task orders, right? Yep, exactly. It's all firm fixed price. It's all pre negotiated, so all the hard work has already been done. And the contract it is just a pricing menu. So if somebody says, hey I want you to build, or I want a, a virtual F-15 so that I can do uh, hydraulics training or avionics training. You can go to our the IDIQ and just pick from a menu and say, I want one of these, one of these, two of these, one of these. And the task orders can be can be cut within a day or two by the contracting officer. So like I said, all the all the hard work, all the negotiation has already been done. It's The prices are there. And if you have the budget, we have the contract vehicle, you need both. <laughs> Uh, I had a, a good friend of mine, he was running the uh, F-35 uh, test program out at Nellis. And the reason that the F-35 ended up maturing into this uh, kind of uh, call it crowdsource flight data 
is they figured out how to establish one of these contracts and then they could bring in vendors when they had end of your money, they would put it on this vehicle and then they would use it to uh, get vendors in. And so now they're looking at big data and things like that. So huge, huge upside. The fact that you, you have this, that's, that's great. So your, your clock starts pretty much now and you've got three years with a $90 million ceiling, which means um, you're probably not going to, if you do max it out, congratulations, but it's a, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, it, and it's an Air Force contract, a department of the Air Force, right? So that means if you're in the Space Force, you can use it too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. When we we were going through the process, people outside of some people thought it was just for Air Force, completely decentralized. So any contracting office can cut, can cut task orders. It doesn't need to be uh, the 82nd uh, contracting squadron out of Shepard who originated. It can be any contracting squadron. And yes, across all the match comms in the Air Force as well as Space Force. So it's Department of Air Force wide. Uh, yeah, we're, we're excited. I think it gives us an opportunity to to really deliver a lot of value over the next three years to the to the Air Force and Space Force. Yeah, that's a really good point because it's not just the Air Education Training Command, AETC, is what you would think of these kinds of things, mm-hmm. but Air Combat Command, Global Strike, um, Air Force Material Command, where they have Air Force Test Center. There's so much stuff going on with new tech that's coming down the the, the pipeline, and um, even some of the basic courses. So you learn how to you get your pilot wings, learn how to fly air and aircraft. But say you go fly uh, like the F-15E or something like that. Those some of those pilot training bases are actually not education and training. They're in Air Combat Command, and so the ability to kind of span the span the the gap of all those commands with this contract vehicle is really good. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, you're 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 spot on. I mean, AETC should be the and is the largely a, a training command, but training happens in the operational commands as well. We're working with Global Strike, AMC. Um, there's there's training that happens in every every major command, and this is a, a contracting a contract vehicle that that all all of them can use. I know you're just at the beginning of this journey because you have this contract vehicle in place. Uh, is there anything that's that's just like surprised you, like the weirdest request of like, hey, can you develop training for this? Anything that jumps out at you? Well, we're only two weeks into it, so we haven't got anything weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> and most of, most of the stuff we knew was kind of coming at us from yeah. customer from Air Force customers that we've been uh, we've had a history with. But uh, yeah, I fully expect because it's it's the the contract is written in a kind of semi-generic way. So you can buy, you could buy weird things um, if you just want a, a, a sprint's worth of, of stuff from us, basically a two week of our, of our team. And they could, that could turn into, we could be building some weird, weird things, but we don't know yet. That sounds like an excuse for me to have you back on in a year. <laughs> I'm about see. to say, we'll check, we'll check back in a year <laughs> and we'll see what's the weirdest thing that was purchased on our IDIQ. I'm sure there will be one. <laughs> You have three years ahead of you. That's going to be really exciting. Um, but what's your uh, what's your vision of where you want to be? Kind of at the end of that. Um, no, that's a great question. Um, you know, we have historically, you know, our history with the Air Forces, uh, and this we haven't really talked about this, but we've we've leveraged the SBIR program pretty extensively in in the past five years, the Small Business Innovation Research Cyber Program, and it's a for those who are trying to figure out how to how to crack into the U.S. government and, and the Department of Defense, it's a great way to get in. Phase one, phase two, phase three, and this is this IDIQ is kind of our natural evolution of that. But as a result of the SBIR program, it's a lot of R&D, and this IDIQ is very much an operational contract. So it's how do we take this technology that we've been doing R&D over the past five years and really operationalize it across the Air Force? So it's we think it's an opportunity for us to deliver a lot of immersive, what we call digital classrooms. So an F-15 on the flight line or a, a, a C-17 or a CB-22 or whatever. We want to deliver all of these digital classrooms that can then push forward immersive training within the Air Force. And, you know, if we can, if we can deliver these digital classrooms, all the subject matter experts out there with, throughout the Air Force can go in and create lessons all day long. At the end of the three years, I hope we have 20... 30 new digital classrooms of all the aircraft platforms in the Air Force and a lot of training content courseware that's built on top of those across the Air Force. So we're super excited. I mean, this has been a, we've, the, the contracting officers within the Air Force have been amazing at, at Shepard Air Force Base, 82nd uh, Contracting Squadron. They've, 
they've shepherded us, pardon the pun, through this. And we think we have a really nice opportunity to do some uh, some pretty amazing things with the Air Force for the next next three years and hopefully beyond. Yeah, if you can get in on the on the H sixty whiskey, the new uh, rescue helicopter from the Air Force, that's a a nice bridge to the Army because they have a a lot of aircraft and they have a lot of uh, problems with training as well. So there's definitely there's, you know the other services we haven't talked about them. There's there's definitely a lot of growth potential. Uh, now that you have traction in the Air Force and I think over time you're going to increase your footprint, increase your exposure. And I think people are going to hear more about what you're doing. Yeah. You mentioned the H60 and we're talking to Air University who's uh, partnering up with the Army. Uh, hey. at, at Rocker <laughs> I and, didn't know that. And, and Yulis. Yeah. I, I, I mean, promise. So, I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, pr- I appreciate the plug though. Or the, the initiation of that. Yeah. We'd, we would love to. Uh, and, and this IDIQ gives us an opportunity to to, again, have that contract vehicle that Air University could put money on this contract, build the H-60 and and partner and deliver with the Army. So we're excited. I didn't actually know that you uh, you were went through the SIPR program. So I, uh, I have a friend, my co-host, Tim, he's not here. He's, uh, he's our small business fanboy, um, loves it, uh, big proponent, works in an accelerator on the side. And he and I talk a lot and we're like, what does success look like? And a lot of people think of su- success out of the SIBR program is, you know, oh, I get into a quote program of record, but, but not, you don't really need to get into a program of record for all things. And I think this is a great example of showing you, hey, I have a contract vehicle and now I can go out and I can do business at the local level with task orders with people who have money. Uh, so it, it's uh, it's nice to see there's, a, there's more than one way to, to see success out of the SIBR program. And I, and I, I'm guilty of being a naysayer at times against it because it, it does have some drawbacks, but, uh, the success stories are, are great and I love to highlight them on the show. So thanks for sharing that. I did not know you were a cyber program participant. How to, oh, <laughs> I did been, not, I'll do better research next time. Yeah, no, no, no. It's been, uh, I, I think it's a great program. I mean, there are challenges with it, but it's, uh, you know, we went through phase ones and phase two is phase twos. And we thought, or we were told once you get to a phase three, that's the Holy grail. Not so much. It's that's that's a, that's a step along the journey. But we've done a couple of phase threes, and and this IDIQ kind of spawned from that SBIR program because we, we've already competed through the SIBR process. So this IDIQ can be a sole source for us. We've already gone through the competition process. So I, I'm a big fan of the SIBR program. Yeah, it's also great because like a SIBR phase three, you have to have a program office that's actually funding it. It's not the small mm-hmm. business association, right. uh, whereas the IDIQ, it's like, I have a contract vehicle and now I can pick up, you know, little pockets of pennies all around uh, the Air Force solving this problem, which, you know, adds up, obviously, instead yeah. of one program office that's centralized, just, you know, monolithic thing. And I would imagine that also means that you're very, uh, you can kind of layer in the business and, and operations. You do not just get it overwhelmed with like a, you know, here's a $90 million order execute. And, <laughs> and you probably, you're, you know, you probably have less than 50 people or a hundred people or so. Yep. Uh, you're, you're, you're pretty close there with the 50. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, you're 50, 50 person company with a $90 million order. And now you're scratching your head. Like, how are we going to execute? So this is a good way where you can kind of stagger in, in the business right. as you kind of get up to speed. Absolutely. And that's what we're doing. you know, we're obviously looking for those end of year fallout funds that you mentioned earlier. So the Air Force doesn't buy furniture and printers exclusively, but, <laughs> but yeah, you're right. We want to be able to manage that inbound, um, uh, requirements with the ability to, to scale the company. And we, we think we have a pretty, pretty good plan for that. All right. I'm going to change gears here for a minute and I'm going to put you on the spot if that's okay. Sure. <laughs> Let's say I want uh, an immersive training experience and yeah, I've heard of HTX labs. I've heard of, I see like three or four companies. If I'm the consumer, what are the questions I should ask when I go to all these companies and go, like, do you do this? Do you do that? Educate the consumer so they can make a better decision. I guess what I'm, what I'm asking. Yeah. What are the things that you would, that you would like to highlight if that consumer wants to go out and do the market research? What should they ask? It is a great question and something that we've worked on over the past, you know, six or seven years. Huh. And that's, and that's the reason we built the company like we have, and, and we've taken this platform approach, but the questions you have to ask is, Am I locked into you for the rest of my natural life? Like if I have to come back to the vendor, whether it's us or anybody else, every time I want a a change to the F-16 immersive environment or to the courseware, you're talking about a contract mod, you're talking about 
additional funding, and you're talking about six to 12 months before it gets delivered. And that is not how we operate. Um, you, The Air Force, when we build a virtual F-16, the Air Force owns that digital classroom. We don't own it. You paid us. We built it. We delivered it. You own it. And now you can sustain it over time. Uh, we have the tools that allow you to, if I need to uh, implement the avionics system now with the right skill set, and we're working with a group called the Griffin, the Air Force 367 Training Support Squadron, they are using MPACT to sustain the things that we built for the Air Force. So hmm. vendor lock is something that we're hypersensitive to, and we know the Air Force doesn't want to get locked into uh, a single vendor. Distribution and deployment, that's why we are a cloud-based technology. How do I get this to the point of need more easily and, and more readily? So everything is cloud-based. A new student, a new airman can basically get registered on impact and start learning immediately. So we need to be able to get this in the hands of, of those who need the technology. And if, you know, if you're using a thumb drive or you know, sneaker net or something like that to distribute, that is not going to scale. Your students are going to get frustrated. How do you get updates out to them? Everything has to be cloud-based. And then we talked about the cybersecurity. If the technology doesn't have an ATO, I'm not sure how that addresses the need for airmen and guardians to learn. So uh, those are the things that I think you have to ask when you're looking for an XR vendor to partner with. I can tell you've been around government IT because you use the term sneaker net. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. That, yeah. that's a really popular term in, in certain government circles, especially when you get to closed networks that are air gapped. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we saw a lot of that when in the early PT uh, pilot training next days is, is that's exactly how things were, how updates were made. That's how we delivered our software at the time is on a, on a thumb drive or a secure FTP or something like that. That is not how this is supposed to be done in the contemporary day uh, that we're in. So. Man, I just I had flashbacks of sneaker. Flashbacks, sorry oh, about that. Oh, PTSD, <laughs> PTSD. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Scott, we're getting a little short on time. Uh, before we wrap it up, what are the things that I missed? There, there's obviously some really cool stuff on the website. We'll put a, a link in the show notes. And, um, for all the listeners or viewers, if, well, if you're listening on your podcast, I uh, highly recommend go to the YouTube channel. We'll splice in a bunch of uh, videos and pictures to uh, explain what we're talking about. If you're watching this on YouTube, you've already seen it. Congratulations. Uh, you're here the whole time. <laughs> so, uh, so Scott, what are we, uh, what, what else do you want to chat about? What are we missing? I think we covered a lot. Um, I encourage people to explore this technology. It is the future of learning period. Not because we think it is, but because this is the natural evolution of computer-based training or e-learning. Like I said before, it's what the incoming demographic is going to require in order to learn. So check out our website, look at the competition, read the Gartner reports, whatever you want. But this is a way to address the pilot shortage, for example, develop a higher proficiency. People need to learn by doing the thing they're trying to become proficient or prepared for. It's the way that the human mind works. So now, we're excited about our future. We're excited about our partnership with the, the Department of the Air Force, and we're ready to move out. Awesome. Well, I, I learned a lot today. Um, I, I didn't know how to spell VR, and so it turns out it's actually <laughs> XR because we want the full immersive experience. So, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes for HTX Labs' um, homepage, and you, ha you can see the impact. But if someone's listening and they want to actually figure out, like, how do I – uh, put my money on that contract, who do they need to contact? So they can uh, certainly email us, collaborate at hdxlabs.com, and we'll, we can help with that. But um, we're about to put out some marketing on the IDIQ so that people know what, it's, what the purpose is and, and how to get started. But any airman or guardian can talk to their contracting officer and they should be able to figure out how to use our IDIQ. But we're going to start promoting that with the Air Force and with the Space Force within those two organizations. So, uh, But if you want to email collaborate at hjxlabs.com, we will help you figure out how to use the contract. Awesome. And I'll put that in the show notes as well. Uh, I'm really happy to help you get the word out. Uh, this looks like really exciting stuff. And uh, I'm going to have to have you guys back on in a year to kind of get a get a check in and see how things are going. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely report back on the weirdest request and, uh, uh, that we've had on the IDIQ. But no, we really appreciate you having us on today. I uh, love this podcast and we're excited to get the word out as well. All right. Well, you heard it. Go check out the website. 
And uh, while you're online, check out the video on YouTube because that's where the, the videos and the pictures are of what everything we're talking about with uh, Impact. And while you're there, make sure you like, follow, and subscribe. Uh, that's going to be it. That's the pod. Until next time, see ya.